but really to understand the issue of substance abuse. It is something that plays on demand and supply. Like we said initially, we are just barely a transit nation, but we are not consuming it. However, as time was going on, that narrative began to change. And when we started our intervention, we actually started an intervention to deal with the supply chain. And we have done that for years. But it is not working. You know why? Because the, if you don't balance the intervention, which is basically threefold, drug demand supply reduction, drug demand, uh, drug supply reduction, drug uh, demand reduction, then in some kinds you call harm reduction. If you don't balance this and you focus on drug supply, you will create the Mexican scenario, the Latin American scenario. And that is where we are driving towards. And you cannot be driving towards that at the time that countries are beginning to opt out of the convention. Of all these conventions, the Grand Norm, which is the 1961 convention, actually made provision for legal regulation by countries of these narcotic substances. But for some reason, these nations tend to go towards the war on drugs based on the United, um, United States of America's influence. Influence. But as time is going on, you know, which you can even see what is happening in the US, that has actually failed woefully. That has actually failed woefully. So drug supply reduction is needed, but it is meant to be intelligent based. In short, talking about drug supply reduction, the Convention on uh, Illicit Trafficking, the 1988 Convention, targeted the motive behind trafficking, which is confiscation of the profits. Not death sentence. Making sure that you deny the people the reason for why they got into the business. That's the money, the, proceeds. the properties, the proceeds. So it is more of an intelligent led drug supply intervention. But we have a problem. We have a problem because most of the time you don't get to the real people that make the profits. You don't get to the balance. So it is the replaceable moves that you always get to. That's one aspect of it. The second aspect of it is the political will. There is a drug distribution guideline developed by the Pharmaceutical Society of Nigeria together with the Pharmacist Council of Nigeria. For years, for years, we have been asking the government, why can't we put into action? this drug um, supply guideline the national drug supply guideline it is in the country the document has been there lying down it is the political will to implement it because if you do that you will number one know who to hold responsible when some drugs get diversified into illicit market diverted into illicit market so the country have not even done that one so we have seen that see drug supply reduction uh, as good as it is if you do it so well, what you will do is to make the trade very risky, but at the same time, you make the business more profitable. Are you getting it? Absolutely. Because there are a serious demand. And so, the world is actually moving towards a public health approach, which deals with the root causes. Because in the conventions that, that established the, uh, the drug intervention, they referred to the root causes of drug abuse. Let me give you an example. I said the pharmaceutical opioids are basically the best of an AJ6 you get globally. So normally it is recognized that people use it for medical reasons. So the question is the abuse. So what is causing people to abuse it? Because the people will still go for the drugs, demand the drugs, if you, if you don't deal with that aspect. So what public health approach that is based on human rights is targeting the root causes. Why is there so much demand? When you do a drug supply reduction approach only, which is majorly what Nigeria has done for a very long time, you make the business more creative. 
because there is serious demand for these substances. People are demanding for these substances. People are using these substances, and you are you are you are reducing the supply. So the the traffickers are making far much more money. It becomes a far more lucrative business. So if we really look at the 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 2018 National Drug Use Survey, again, an analysis that was done, you, you will be shocked. All right. First, okay, you want to ask a question? Well, okay. First, on the drug demand, the demand is so high, like I mentioned, 14.3 million liters. But not just that, one of the major revelations of that survey is the drug use among ages 50 to 64. That's amazing. Ages 50 to 64. Are you saying that all of them are criminals? There is a high use of cannabis among that age. There is a high use of pharmaceutical opioids among those people. There is a high use of cough syrup containing codeine among this age group. So the question is, what is causing it? Now another interesting revelation about that survey is that three quarters of the respondents in that survey were rural based, apart from southwest, in the other regions, they were rural based. And so it tells us the level of substance abuse that is going on in the hinterland. So the question is, if we are doing intervention just on arrest, prosecute, and jail, how many NDLE officers get down to the hinder, uh, hinderlands? That's the question we start asking us. How many of them? How many? So, one of the things that amazed me, we went to a, a, a village in Indian. He said, we are farmers. We do this thing manually. And so, we use them to do the farm work, number one. And when we finish, we use them to suppress the pain to be able to sleep. And so, when you look at this, in short, there was a gay young man that So they have a totally different motive. Yes, they completely totally different motive. And you know, the narrative of crime and drugs is something I've always had problem with. Yes, there are criminals that use drugs, but it is not drugs that makes them criminals. Yes. Now, this I started off in this field working. I actually worked a lot with NDLA. At the point in time, I was doing pro bono counseling for their people. That's people that are in their centers. And they kept up this narrative that drug is driving crime, drug is driving crime. In the course of it, I met a young man by the name of Gil Adeyibi, the founder of Future Rise Nigeria, who also powering this event. And he began to give me a different, different narrative about the drug use. And so to have in my own view, we, we, we did a research. We went to the prison, the maximum prison, and requested for 80 inmates convicted inmates who have about three months to the end of their sentence and we decided to intervene.